We're going to pick up a little bit with where I left off last week, although I, I, wanna, I need to present some of what I presented last week for those who weren't here, but I'll try to move quickly through that. We're in Acts chapter 26. Uh, Paul, now remember, Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. Um, it's a historical narrative of the early church. But the two dominant characters in the book of Acts are Peter in the beginning and then Paul really in the second half. Um, Paul at this point is about 56 years old. He's been a Christian for about 25 years and he's been involved in active ministry for about 12 years. He's gone on three or four, perhaps five missionary journeys depending upon how you want to count it. And now in chapter 26, he's um, getting to the end of his life, we know, um, and he's going on trial. Um, he, is, he returned to Jerusalem where uh, a mob of Jews wanted to kill him. Um, the Romans put him basically under arrest to kind of save his life and quench this mob situation. And so he's now at this point, he's on trial for a second, a third time, this go around. And he's before the, um, the newly appointed governor Festus in this area. And this King Agrippa who came to pay his respects to Festus. And so Paul at this point is presenting to them a defense of himself. Um, the Romans are not really sure what to charge him with. He really hasn't broken any laws, <laughs> at least as far as they can tell, uh, that this is an internal religious squabble. Um, and so uh, he's going to be sent to Rome. He appealed as a Roman citizen to have a trial before Caesar in Caesar's court. So he's going to be sent there. And Festus, um, along with Agrippa, is trying to determine what, if anything, they can put on this indictment as they send him to Rome? What charges he could be brought up on, if anything? So in his defense, he first presents how he, in fact, was and is a devout Jew, that he was raised um, as a very strict Jew. He was a member of the uh, Pharisees, a very strict Jewish sect. So. Uh, here is, uh, he's not against Judaism, uh, nor is he unfamiliar or was ever wavering. He was the strictest of Jews. And because of his devotion to God, his strictness to Judaism, he then goes on and tells how he initially persecuted Christians. And he did so vehemently. Um, and uh, he pursued Christians in order to stamp them out, to, um, to stamp out the name of Jesus, who he considered to be a blasphemer, and any who followed him. And then Paul goes on to talk about his miraculous conversion. Now, I just want you to remember, we think of Paul as bold and fearless, and, but again, try and put yourself in his position, perhaps, here he is on trial again. He's before these Roman officials, right? And this royal court, as it were. And yet the way that Luke records his defense, it's, it's very matter of fact. Here are the facts. This is what you need to understand. He shows proper respect to them as authorities. But he's not timid or afraid or scared or, and especially when he talks about this conversion experience that he has with God, he's not at all hesitant to talk about it. It's not just a mystical vision or something he had or a dream one night, but a genuine real encounter, fact of life encounter with Jesus Christ. And that's the way he tells it. So we're going to pick up here, and I'm just going to focus on verses 13 through 16. We'll look at the rest of what he says um, next week. But this week, just 13 through 16. So he's addressing Agrippa and Festus, and he's telling about his miraculous conversion. About noon, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven brighter than the sun shone down on me and my companions. 
We all fell down, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me and tell them what I will show you in the future. Now we're going to do a little aside here. It's not the point of it, but it, it, this, this whole interaction raises all sorts of, I think, important and interesting issues. And there's four words in particular of this section that I want to focus on. The Lord appeared to Paul. The Lord appointed Paul as a servant and as his witness. Appeared, appoint, servant, and witness. And the question I raise with these four is, is what was true of Paul, is it true of you? Is it true of me? Has Jesus appeared to you? Has Jesus appointed you as his servant and witness? And you know, as I say that, I think back a number of years ago, if I was sitting here listening to this message, I would just think, well, that's, that's crazy. You know, I don't, I just don't even, I wouldn't, back then, I wouldn't even think of being a Christian or my relationship with Christ in any of these terms. And I would find it very difficult to think that I could in any way be like Paul. Has Jesus appeared to me as he appeared to Paul? And the answer is no. I wasn't, no bright light came from heaven. No voice spoke to me. Jesus didn't speak to me. He didn't appear to me. I don't know if he has to you, but I suspect that for most of us, this is an extremely rare occurrence. So I wouldn't even begin to think, has Jesus appeared to me as he appeared to Paul? Because no, he hasn't. Has Jesus appointed me as he appointed Paul? Well, I, don't, I think most of us don't think so. When we think of being appointed, well, first of all, Paul, you know, I guess we mean like, you know, he went and preached, he was a missionary, he started churches. I'm not appointed to anything like that. I'm not doing those things. I'm not capable of doing those things. So some people, like you might say, well, like Dave has a call. You know, when I first came into the ministry, I was examined by the Christian Missionary Alliance or when I was um, planning, my wife and I were planning to go out as missionaries with the Christian Missionary Alliance, we were questioned and examined and in both cases, of course, the question was, tell us about your call. Tell us about your call to the ministry. And so I think most of us think of call as being, well, that's for some people. God has called some people to the ministry. He hasn't called everyone. So he hasn't appointed everyone. And most of us as Christians don't feel like we have some calling or appointment, you know, specifically from God. And then do I think of myself as a servant and a witness? I know those terms, and we talk about that sometimes. But more naturally, I think of myself as a believer, as a Christian. <laughs> you know, I might use those terms, servant and witness, but I don't know how really I think about those things. So I think generally, we don't think of ourselves as Paul. We don't think of ourselves as, you know, some of these super saints, like, I don't know, Francis of Assisi or whoever. 
you know, Mother Teresa or Billy Graham or, you know, they're just, they're different people, obviously. They're different. They're special. They're called. They're whatever. They're appointed. They have experiences like Paul. And most of us are not like that. We live common, everyday lives. We're not off doing great things. So I won't, I won't do, spend a lot of time developing that, but I, I will just point you to a verse that follows the section that we've just looked at. You see, when Paul finishes his defense, uh, Festus and Agrippa, how do they respond to Paul? Now you would think, this is the Apostle Paul, surely he has the Holy Spirit, surely he preaches and speaks with power. They, I'm sure they were converted. But no, in fact, their response to Paul is to say, you are out of your mind, Paul. You are, out of, you are insane. <laughs> All your learning has driven you insane. They're not receptive to his message. But then Paul, and they say, do you think you can so quickly convert us to Christianity by your presentation? And Paul says this in verse 19, or 29. I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. Now, isn't that interesting? He prays and expects and desires and would hope that everyone would become as he is. So Paul's expectation is for us is that we would become like him. We would be like him, minus the chains. He believes there's no difference between him and us. So to me, you know, hey, that's good news. Because I would like to have a relationship with God like Paul. So let's look at these. Let me focus on these four words. The first one is appeared. Jesus appeared to Paul. There's two aspects of this Jesus appearing that I want to bring out. The first is the personal aspect. And I talked about this last week. It is not uncommon for us to talk about or tell somebody, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? But I find that most of us who profess to have a professional or personal relationship with Christ, perhaps I have a professional relationship with Christ, do not have a personal relationship with Christ. Think about the way you think about Jesus, the way you think about Christianity, the way you practice it, the way you live. When you talk about Christ, do you talk about him as a person, or do you talk about more doctrine and theology? When you talk about Christ, when you think about Christ, when people see your relationship with Christ, does it come across more as a religious relationship? Are you, do you talk more about church or the latest Christian book that you're reading or your devotions? When you talk about Christ, when people see how you, what your relationship with Christ is, does it come across more as principles by which we should live our lives? Certain morals that you want to practice or advocate? A political position? You know, in, in, in our culture, right, uh, in, in, in modern media, circles, evangelical Christianity is not identified with Christ. It's often publicly identified as what? Having a conservative political point of view or certain political issues. That's what Christians are known for. And frankly, when I talk with some Christians and that's the first thing out of their mouths or the last thing and everything in between is what's happening with some politics or some issue or something, 
What do I see what's most important to them? Morals, politics, political positions, doctrine, their practice of their religion. Or sometimes it's, he's just an imaginary character to, to us. We keep him private. We don't talk about him. We pull him out when we're in our secret room and we pray to him or in the privacy of our car. But we wouldn't want to offend anybody else or push our secret Jesus on anybody. But oh, he's so important to me and so real to me. But what you see here is Paul has this encounter with Jesus and it's it's real. Jesus is real and his encounter is real, just as if Jesus physically appeared before him and he talks about it in that way. So he's not just excited about his experience, which we can sometimes do, but about the person of Jesus Christ, the reality of Jesus Christ to him. And as I pointed out last week, so it was, as I say here, it was not an experience he had, but an introduction to a person, an introduction to Jesus. And so then as he goes on as his life, or as he writes in Philippians 3, it wasn't good enough to just have an experience. It wasn't good enough to just have my sins forgiven and that declared, or me righteous, or something like that, or be baptized. No, I want to know him. The fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, to know the power of his resurrection. See, I want to know him experientially because he's a real person to me. He's real. He is. You know, we sing all these songs and or hymns and choruses that we sung this morning. Crown him with many crowns. He's on the throne. He's, right? He is real. He's not just that to us. He's a real person. This reminded me of a, um, an, an interesting quote, a powerful quote, I think, um, from Donald Miller in his book, All God's Children in Blue Suede Shoes. He writes this. A guy we know named Alan went around the country asking leaders, ministry leaders questions. He went to successful churches and asked the pastors what they were doing, why what they were doing was working. It sounded very boring, except for one visit he made to a man named Bill Bright, the president of a big ministry. Alan said he was a big man, full of life, who listened without shifting his eyes. Alan asked a few questions. I don't know what they were, but as a final question, he asked Dr. Bright what Jesus meant to him. Alan said Dr. Bright could not answer the question. He said Dr. Bright just started to cry. He sat there in his big chair behind his big desk and wept. When Alan told that story, I wondered what it was like to love Jesus that way. I wondered, quite honestly, if that Bill Bright guy was just nuts or if he really knew Jesus in a personal way so well that he would cry at the very mention of his name. I knew that I would like to know Jesus like that with my heart, not just my head. I felt like that would be the key to something. There's a second aspect about the appeared. First is personal. The second is it is God initiated. Paul, the, oh, well, all these are important, but this, <laughs> Paul is in the dark, right? He, as far as he knows, he's serving God. He's persecuting Christians. Jesus is a blasphemer. And God doesn't just say, well, he's doing the best he can. Well, he's sincere. Well, he's very religious. Who am I to, why should we offend him? We don't really know much, but we don't know who God is. There's many religions. Let everybody follow whatever way they want. No, 
God comes to Paul. God initiates the relationship. Comes with a bright light, sound, speaks to him, knocks him off his horse. <laughs> and that is the same is true of us. God is always the initiator in a relationship with him. I've mentioned this so many times. Uh, if you are not familiar with Hebrews 11.6, now all of the chap uh, chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews is about faith. So I encourage you to look at the context of this verse. And in that chapter, the writer of Hebrews is talking about the nature of faith and the nature of one's a, re a faith relationship with God. And in verse 6, he says this, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. It is impossible to please God. Now, you should remember this when you are convinced that if you could just convince someone else about Jesus, about how he's better, about whatever, trying to convert them to Christianity, if we just had the right apologetics, if I just had the right arguments, if we just had a better example as a family or whatever, if it, well, all of these things, then they would come to faith in Christ. And God uses things like that. But remember, you can never escape faith. You can never escape faith. And faith is what? Faith is fundamentally a gift from God. It is never in the end an, int an, an intellectual problem. It is never in the end an emotional problem. It is always a problem of the will. And faith is a matter of the will. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then there are these two tenets that are foundational. Number one, you must believe that God exists. And number two, and this is the emphasis here, that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. He responds to those who earnestly seek him. Seek, seek him. God is always reaching out to him. And this is so important. I'll just mention this in just a minute. But we live in a culture, and even among Christians, that are constantly reinforcing, no, it is we who reach out to God. We can't know God. He's mysterious. He's, he's, as if he's always trying to hide from us and always trying to make it difficult. When the opposite, or at least what the Bible, what God reveals to us about it, the opposite is true. He is a reward. He responds to those who earnestly seek him. Um, you know, uh, John's gospel is often called the gospel of love. And here you see one of the most well-known verses in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Who is the initiator there? God is the initiator. It is God who reaches out. It is God who gives his son. It's not us, you know, and again, all of the, the terms we use, we tell people, oh, you should receive Christ as your Savior. You should believe in him. You should take him as your Savior. What, you should do this. You should do that, right? It's all what we do for him, to reach out to him. So Paul here, or John is, in chapter 3, he, in the beginning, he talks about he's, is, 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 is Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus, this religious man, this religious Jew who comes to Jesus and who is perplexed <laughs> about what Jesus says to him when Jesus, you know, about being born again. 
And Nicodemus says, basically, well, how can I do that? You see, it's very man-centered to God. How can I do that? Just like when you say, well, I have to obey certain things in order to please God. It's me doing something for God. Not God coming to me, me going to God. So Nicodemus says, so how can I be born again? I can't go back in my mother's womb. How do I do this? And what does Jesus say? You can't do this. This is a work of the Spirit. It is a work of the Spirit. So the question is, well, wait, if God is reaching out, God is pouring out love, God gave his son, why, in John's mind, is why is, why is Jesus hated? Why are Christians persecuted? Why is the gospel rejected? God is reaching out. And that's what he goes on to say. God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But then he goes on and says this. He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But, in verse 19 he uses it, here is the conclusion of the matter, or here is the verdict. <laughs> is man the problem, or is God the problem? Again, in our culture, most of the time, God is the problem. We're the good people. We're trying to do what's right. We're trying to reach out to him. But God makes it so difficult. And John is saying, God is the initiator. God is always the one who reaches out. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. Isn't that what Hebrews... Those who earnestly seek, he will reward. They will come into the light. So that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Or as the NLT converts it, so that, or translates it, so others can see that they are doing what God wants. This is the verdict. Light has come. But men love darkness. We turn from the light. The problem is not with God. So as you see here, let's talk about our culture. The problem is with God. We think of our relationship with God, a relationship with God as man initiated. Do you believe in God? What do you believe about God? Well, I think this, I think that, I'm trying to do that. I don't know, this or... And, and, and so there's this general cultural expectation that you cannot know God. And the appeal is to reason. Look, Pat, Veronica, Jim, do you think you know God? Well, I, 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 I mean, I, that's a big thing to say I know God. I mean, I, on one level, I think I know God, yes. Oh, that's just your religion. You think you're right. But what about the Muslim, the Hindu, the atheist, all of the other people? And the more access that we have to the world via the internet and everything, we see different cultures, different people, and everybody has a different opinion about God. We cannot know God. Either we just make up the God we want, and if there is a God, obviously we cannot know him because everybody says he's different. So again, here we are talking about God and it's his problem. I don't know why he makes it so difficult, but we can't really know him. And then we might throw on, you know, a, 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 a fake false accolade. Well, that's because he's so great. He's so great we can't ever know him. We're just like feeling around the edges and everybody's feeling a different edge or whatever. So we, we can't really know. So you can't really, you shouldn't criticize or say anybody's wrong. We're either all wrong, you know. <laughs> we just don't know. And, and you see, that is blasphemous to the very nature of God. He is reaching out. 
You can know him. No, we can't. So, so the whole mentality of our, the way we think about God and be, is this orientation of us going out to God, us bringing God in, us reaching out to God, and therefore God, when we do find him or whatever, whatever we think, he serves us. He serves us. Just like the famous, you know, God is just the opiate of the masses. He's a myth. He's a story. He's a psychological illness. A crutch for people. You see, even in the imaginary sense, he's something that serves us. Helps you cope. But you see, no, the, the God appeared is God initiated. One, one last thing I just want to, how it affects how we think about evangelism. Now, I hope you think about evangelism. Evangelism is not just for Billy Graham. It's not just uh, you know, for professionals. It's not just something churches do, evangelistic programs or outreaches. It's what, by nature, you should be doing as a Christian. You, I, you know, I was thinking about that as we were singing that chorus. Oh, how wonderful. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how glorious you are. And we sing that again and again and again. I think, do I really act as if God is marvelous and glorious and wonderful? Do I really act that way? <laughs> Would anybody get that from the way I live? If somebody said to me, are you a Christian? Are you a Christ follower? Do you believe in God? Do you believe in God of Jesus Christ? Do you believe Jesus Christ is God? Who? Well, who? I don't. You know, and we get very sheepish and we act as if we're embarrassed by God. How does that go with, oh, how glorious, oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful? You are amazing. So with this man-centered orientation, I find what, one of the effects it has on us is we want to compromise. Because, see, we don't, we don't believe it is God-initiated and God's work. It's our work. And so we, 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 we feel like we have to have the answers, the intellect, the, we have to sweeten the deal for people. You know, like if we... <laughs> I, we would never tell them the hard things about Christianity like discipleship or you have to go to church or something. So we'll, we'll share with somebody who might show some interest and they say, well, yeah, I think I'd like to become a Christian. And then, you know, at least the way I was taught and brought up was, okay, then I lead them in a sinner's prayer or pray, that they pray to give their life to Christ. And then what? Well, and then I say, well, you're in, <laughs> you know. Uh, that's great. Uh, never doubt your salvation. You're a child of God now. Uh, Dave, would you ever say you should go to church? Well, I, I don't want them to be confused with it being works. Would you ever say they should be a disciple or that they should die to themselves? They should no longer live for themselves but for Christ? That's part of the deal? Well, I... I well, if, if I said that, they wouldn't want to become a Christian. So we leave those difficult, quote, end quote, difficult parts, the hard things out. Just get them in. That's what matters. Just get them in. And then also, you know, we have a reluctance because, again, like you know, I say to people, have you ever talked to anybody about Jesus Christ? No. Why wouldn't you? Well, uh, let me tell you why. Because I feel these things too. Because I'm scared. That's the number one thing. I'm afraid to talk to people about Jesus Christ. Why are you afraid? Well, one of the biggest reasons is, well, one is I don't want to offend them. Number two is I don't want somebody to think that I'm a kook. And they'll think I'm a nut if I 
I'm, I'm, stu I'm stupid or I'm, you know, I don't want them to think that. So I would be embarrassed to bring it up. Uh, number three is uh, they aren't, I know they won't want it anyways. They won't, they're not interested in Jesus anyways. And number four is I'm really scared that if I say something about Jesus, they'll attack me or they'll ask me questions and I won't be able to answer them. What about the Bible? What about this? Are you telling me that? And I, I won't know what to say, and then I'll, that'll, that'll make me look stupid, and maybe that'll be worse than if I would have never said anything. So I, I feel reluctant to, to, do, to, to say anything. Okay, now how does that square with... Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, oh, how glorious, you are amazing. But, you know, see, it seems like, maybe I'm reading into the text here, but boy, when Paul talks about what happened to him and his defense, it just seems so matter-of-fact. This is just the way it is. This is just the truth. And then he doesn't plead with Agrippa and Festus. And then they say, do you think you can convince us to be Christians? <laughs> he says, I pray that everyone would come like me, become like me. It's a, you see, what, it, it's, what the point is this is, when, you, when, you, when I see, when I really appreciate and understand, it is a work of God then when I speak with people, when I share with people, I don't have to win them to Christ. I don't have to convert them. I'm just being a witness. I'm just being a witness. I'm just telling people what is the truth. Now, I, I, I admit, just like Agrippa and Festus, when you just say this is what it is, I... You know, I, I think Paul is, I'm thankful because I see the Spirit's convicting work happening. When they say, do you think you can convince us to become Christians? Whoa, Paul. Paul, Paul could say, I never said that. Absolutely never says that. Completely detached. Talks about the gospel as if it's just theology. But it, they understood it had implications for them. So if I, and I'm speaking to myself because I feel all these things, could I, could I have the attitude when, I, when I'm out in public or when I'm with other people, God, I'm just, I just, I, 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 I want you to be so real to me, so wonderful, so marvelous, so amazing to me, that, that speaking of you, just living you, just being a witness for you is it just comes out of me, and I'm not doubting or second guessing or thinking through all these things because I'm just I'm I'm just relying on and seeing where your spirit is working or isn't working. That's all. Okay. So he appointed them and and so that's Let's see, that was, uh, the first word was appeared, and the, and the first two things were, uh, he initiated that, or personal, and then he initiated, God initiated. The second word is appointed, and the two things here is, that's important, is privilege and responsibility. So Jesus in John 15, 16 says this to his disciples, you did not choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. Now notice, God initiated, right? I chose you. <laughs> you did not choose me. God initiated. But in this is both privilege and responsibility. The privilege of being chosen by God. And the privilege of bearing fruit that lasts. And therefore, that being a responsibility to bear fruit that lasts. I just, I, yesterday, I was at the gym running. And I, I, 
I'm telling you, it is really getting to me. I might have been tired or whatever, but I told this to my wife when I came home. I said, ah, the, between the television and the blaring music, and the, and the music, every song is contrary to the way and wills, will of God. I'm telling you, every song is about do what feels good, do what feels right, you are what's most important, sex, money, drugs, constant drone of this kind of, these philosophies of life. And, and it, it, it is sickening. And then I, because they have a basketball court there, and I see these young people playing basketball. And in particular, the thing that got me yesterday was this young woman, who I'm guessing is maybe 14 or 15, and, and you know, she's, 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 she's talking loud, and she's got her phone on, and she's just outside the basketball court, and she's trying to talk to somebody on the basketball court, and then this guy comes out, and they go walking off, you know, and I think, oh my goodness, you know, here she is, she's 14 or 15, this guy looks like he's 20, uh, you know, just, just sad, just sad to see. And, and then I hear this blaring music, this is, this, these, this is how we should live life. And it's just, it's, it is hell. It is hell. We live like animals. The most important thing to us is food or sex or entertainment. And we're just, that is a constant drumbeat. Just, that's, what's, that's all there is in life. That's all there is, beer, cars, women, whatever. That's it, that's the meaning of life, the next sporting event. Oh, this week it's the British Open or the Open. Next week it's, well, what's on Formula One? What are the Yankees doing? Because my life is so empty. That's all I have to look forward to. And just keep, just, just like me on that treadmill, just get on the treadmill and keep going. You're going absolutely nowhere. Working up a sweat and going nowhere. And th th that is the people around us. That is the gospel that they are, we're all swallowing, we're swimming in. And God, here Jesus comes and says, I've called you out of that. <laughs> To live a life that produces lasting fruit. Instead of crap, zero, nothing. I told you some of the, I remember years ago doing, you know, I've said this before, but this one's just so, this is very typical actually, sadly, but doing this woman's funeral. Um, and, and uh, does anybody have anything they would like to share about this woman and her life? And one of her granddaughters got up and said, I'll always remember grandma for her Wrigley Spearmint gum. And another granddaughter got up and said, I'll always remember grandma for Rolo candy or something like that. And that was it. Isn't that pathetic? But you know, for most of us, that's the sum total of our lives. And Jesus comes to people and says, what a wasted existence. I've come so that you might live a life that bears lasting fruit. That not at the end of a whole life, all that is remembered is Wrigley Spearmint Gum.
2 Corinthians 5.15, oh, is this something we should hide? Oh, this is hard. People don't want to become Christians, you know, if we make it too hard. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. <laughs> you know, friend, that is the gospel. There is no better news than to say you no longer live for yourself, but for him. Oh, but we don't. That's bad. Oh, that's, that's negative. People aren't going to like that. All they have to do is pray to receive Christ. Hide those things. That's for people who want to be disciples. Not everybody wants that. So we have what? We have this uh, relationship God, with God that we just emphasize the privilege and no responsibility. So God exists for me to realize my dreams and the pursuit of my happiness. That's what God's there for. Boy, and then, you know, just yesterday, just the, listen to the music. Listen to the music. It is constantly that. Realize your dreams. It's all about you. What is it that you want? We have it even enshrined in, what, the Declaration of Independence. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so what has God become? What has Jesus Christ become to us? Somebody to help me pursue my happiness. Somebody to help me to realize my dreams. And Jesus comes and says, wake up, friends. Your dreams, that is death. That is death and a dead end road. Like we said at the beginning of this service where Jesus said, why you're, you're working for bread that will not satisfy you. Why not get this everlasting bread, the bread I offer you? Here, whoever wants to be my, this, this is the good news. You know, when you listen to the music, when you go to the gym, when you see all the crap of this world, then you realize this is good news. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Okay. Well, he appoints, point, okay, so he appears, he appoints, he, he appoints to what? Serve it. A servant and witness. Servant and witness. So let's, the first one is servant. What is it that characterizes a servant? What is the chief characteristic of a servant? And I'll tell you, it is obedience. It is doing the will of his master. Verse 19, Paul says after he shares his, or as he's sharing his testimony, I, so, and so King Agrippa, I obeyed the vision from heaven. Because Jesus appointed me, what? To be a servant and to witness to the fact that he is alive, that I have seen him, and to what he reveals to me in the future of himself. I obeyed. I obeyed. Acts chapter 20, when we read this before, Paul saying to them, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. I've been reading a number of books on ethics, some of them Christian, some not. But, um, you know, it's interesting in raising the question, what is good, what is right, how do you know what's the right thing to do? Very complicated. And even in Christian texts, you know, I know this is, this is very simplistic. But I, I, I just want to, I think a lot of things would be simplified if you just remember these two things. Jesus Christ called me to be his servant and his witness. What is the right thing to do when your beeline focus is, I am a servant of God? And my question always is, what does, what is obedience? What would my master have me to do? 
Read through the Gospel of John. Jesus is saying that over and over again. I have come to do the will of my Father. Doing the will of my Father is my meat and bread. It's my sustenance. The world must learn that I have come to do the will of the Father. I'm telling you, if you live your life, that it will simplify so many decisions. It'll, it'll, it leads to answers that you don't want often. But if your mindset is obedience to the will of God, that is what I'm... So when I'm in morally questionable situations, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. What does obedience to Jesus Christ look like in this situation? It starts to become very clear. It starts to become very clear. You know, um, I, I'll just skip over this. This is uh, Philippians chapter 2. But... Um, you know, they, mo most scholars believe in Philippians chapter 2 that Paul is quoting a hymn from the early church. I've mentioned this before because of the structure of the Greek in, in that part of, of Philippians, that he's probably quoting a hymn that they're familiar with. And what is this hymn that they sing? And that Paul says, your mindset should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself a servant, becoming a man. And what was it that was key about his servanthood? He was obedient, obedient to death on a cross. Isn't it interesting in the early church, we emphasize again and again, why did Jesus die for us? Oh, because he loves us. Love, God loves us. In the epistle of John, and in John's gospel, I should say, in John's gospel, the gospel of love, John 3, 16, read that gospel. Where do you see Jesus saying, I'm dying for you because I love you? I'm going the cross because I love you. Because I love lost people. I challenge you to find that. What you find again and again is what? Obedience to the Father. I'm going to the cross out of obedience to the Father. That is what is emphasized. And that's what you see emphasized in this early hymn of the church. He was, he made himself a servant. He was obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Isn't it interesting? He doesn't say love. He made us, himself a servant because he loved us. He died on the cross because he loved us. He became a man because he loved us. You don't see that there. Because he was obedient to the will of the Father. That's why. That doesn't negate his love for us, but the emphasis is on obedience. Obedience as a servant of his Father. Okay, well, the second thing is uh, being a witness. And what is it that characterizes being a witness? And the answer is experience. I'll point you to just one uh, passage. Well, uh, you know, here in Acts, as we read, tell people that you have seen me and tell them what I will show you in the future. Is, is that, have I had that kind of experience with Jesus Christ? Is he that real to me? Here's what John writes in his first epistle, in 1 John. I love the opening of this, of this letter. Here's what he writes. Notice how real Jesus is. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship, seen, heard, with, real, <laughs> you see? And that's where I ask, do people, is that true of me? Do people see that in me? 
When I talk about Christ, <coughs> pardon me, when I, how I relate to God, what they see in my life, is he real? Am I a witness in the sense of I have really experienced him? Or witness just in the sense this is what I was told to tell you. This is the theology that I taught, I was taught. Jesus died for our sins. We're all sinners. You need to believe in him and be saved. You should become a Christian. Is there fellowship there with the Father and with the Son? Is it something you've seen and heard and experienced and is real? Learn how to be a witness. That's what I was trained. I was trained to witness to people. Here's tracts that I would use. Here's gospel presentations that I would memorize. Go door to door. How I could present the gospel. How I could respond to people's objections. What, bio, what are the key Bible verses to use? That's being a witness. Being trained and getting the right information. Making sure you give the right gospel. Making sure you can close the deal. Witness here is somebody who knows Christ. Just like that reading earlier. Bill Bright. What does Jesus mean to you? He didn't recite a creed. He didn't spout back a gospel presentation. He wept. Okay, so we're done. Let me. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get to your feet. For I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me and tell them what I will show you in the future. Is what was true of Paul true of you? Appeared, appoint, servant, witness.